But I'll try to give a wider fr framework of where we stand and uh, how the country actually got into a si situation to really start accession negotiations and and and, uh, and of course how the how we envisage to continue in the next years. Um, as you said, the, um, uh, some some words on on the country itself. You know that it's a country which has been independent for uh, the last uh, only six years, six and a half years. So from 2006 on. And um, but a country with a rich history and uh, a history of statehood, uh, which reached until 1918, when we became a part of a bigger country, which was called then uh, Yugoslavia. So um, in 2006, so when you compare the where we stand now and then, uh, you can see that uh, a very different kind of situation. In 2006, the country which was together with uh, Serbia was not a part of any. And it's inter a serious integration effort. Uh, none uh, with the, uh, no, with the uh, neither with the with NATO nor with the um, EU. Uh, now six years after, we are negotiating for the uh, membership with the EU, and we are seriously looking at the next NATO summit in 2014 to uh, get an invitation to join the alliance. Alliance. So as you can see, um, when you compare with the uh, most of the countries that uh, came about after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Montenegrin accession and integration has been uh, one, of, uh, if not one of the fastest, but the fastest uh, one. Um, of course, the 90s and what happened uh, during the um, uh, sanctions period and the civil wars that uh, raged ar around us has uh, had a great impact. And uh, the, 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 the years lost in the 90s have also ha uh, are now having a, a kind of impact on how the country should actually work, uh, and that is, that I mean, much harder and invest much more effort in trying to really align itself with the European key and reach the, the necessary level for the membership. Um, it's a country of 600, 620,000 people, so it's, uh, it's one of the, it's the smallest one of the Yugoslav republics. Um, but the country has been faced with, uh, I would say, a very stable political climate. We have never had a, a kind of a uh, political instability, which is maybe uh, more common to some of the other Balkan states, and uh, the economic uh, uh, situation is has been quite improving in the last years after the crisis in Tufa, which hit the region maybe later than the rest of Europe in 2009. Uh, so we have had the growth of um, um, two and uh, three and 0.5 percent, which puts us in the among the ten countries in Europe, which had a, a sort of growth in the last years. We hope that the tourism, which is the basic branch of our um, economy, along with energy, uh, will uh, continue to grow and to develop in order really to replace the old obsolete socialist industry of aluminium and uh, steel, um, and also to create a good uh, environment in the country for uh, raising the living standards. Um, um, of course, the unemployment uh, is uh, quite, uh, it's almost as the Eurozone uh, average, it's around 12%. Uh, but also there is the fact that Montenegro imports lots of labor from the uh, region uh, during summer months and uh, the season, seasonal kind of, uh, uh, of a migration is, is very common for us. I will now try to give you a sort of um, uh, picture on how actually and what we have with the European Union and how we negotiate and what kind of relationship the uh, Union has with my country. And um, maybe it's uh, the best thing to start with the, uh, the only contractual relationship that the country has with you, which is the Stabilization Association Agreement. You know that the Europe agreements from the 90s have been replaced with the so-called SAAs where well, the stabilization was introduced in order really to show that there is a quite a difference with the Western Balkans. You first stabilize and then you associate yourself. Uh, the SAA uh, was signed in 2007, you see, immediately after we became independent, and then uh, we in entered into force in May 2010. We have been implementing it smoothly, which is a good thing because it really uh, helps the country in uh, all its efforts uh, in aligning with the specific chapters. Um, before that, Montenegro, uh, uh, some t 10 years ago, decided really to become a very liberal economy. And that helped with the SAA, because uh, at the time when we realized that we are such a small economy that you cannot protect it from, um, uh, from the uh, influences, I mean, or the markets outside of the, of the country, uh, was, I think, a good one, because it created the good basis for the SAA, and then, and then 
uh, also to prepare us for the um, inf for the impact of the common market once we join. These are also the bodies that the, uh, have been set up. As you can see, the EU is um, very keen on having lots of bodies on cooperation. You, you see there's the Stabilization Association Council, which is the highest. You mentioned it in your introductory remarks, where we actually sum up all the events within this contractual relationship. The SA committees, the subcommittees, and also the parliamentary dimension of uh, cooperation, along with two joint consultative committees. This is actually a kind of a tool which exists for every country apart from Kosovo. Kosovo is now entering this phase of a feasibility study to get the first SAA. And uh, in these bodies and this kind of a contractual relationship will stay until the end, until we join. Croatia has had uh, the meetings of the bodies until the, uh, the, the very last date uh, um, and it, it is actually in place until it joins. Um, this really helps a lot in uh, our co cooperation because it gives a good uh, um, uh, platform for co uh, communication and uh, experience sharing between our administration and the EU. And now we try uh, um, uh, to streamline uh, the negotiation, um, uh, I would say the negotiation activities within the subcommittees and the committees meeting. So not to duplicate efforts, but actually to have the uh, these kind of bodies as a place where we discuss also the key within uh, various chapters. Uh, IPA, something on the uh, instrument from pre-accession uh, assistance. You know that IPA is a tool of the European Union which helps the countries, uh, the candidate countries in their, uh, and aspiring, aspiring countries in their um, European integration. In the previous period, we had some 235 million, which is subdivided into some 30 to 35 million per year, which is not such a huge amount of money, but it really helps when it comes to, to specific projects. Uh, the next IPA 2, which is now being launched, we'll have um, the first uh, launching meeting this week in, on Friday in Brussels, will be probably the same amount of money for Montenegro which is not too much, you know, Turkey gets uh, 1 billion per year, we get 35 million, so it's a, it's a huge response. But per capita, Montenegro is the, gets most, I mean, the, the highest amount of aid uh, per it, uh, inhabitant. Um, these components that have been marking the uh, IPA 1 are now going to be completely changed. Uh, we'll get into something more of a, a sectoral assistance, so you can forget all of this, and uh, <laughs> we'll all have to get accustomed to a completely new way of dealing with the assistance, but just a, a sort of a, an idea on, on how we actually uh, manage the, the, uh, the funds that we get as, as assistance. Uh, there is another thing, which is the progress reports. You know that uh, the Commission issues each year uh, in October and autumn uh, a kind of a report where it sums up the uh, progress of a country. Uh, last year's one was, and it's basically broken down into um, uh, political criteria, economic criteria, and then the impact of the uh, various chapters, 35 chapters. This is a good guideline and a good, good blueprint for every activity. And basically the progress reports uh, um, uh, tell a country, it's, it's like you have been given each year a kind of a, uh, analysis of yourself. Um, which is very helpful because the Commission is very keen on developing a good uh, analytical paper on where the country stands. Um, this year we have uh, actually decided to use this progress report to extract uh, all the deficiencies that have been seen in the report and uh, pointed out and to create a, a, a very efficient action plan which could be used for um, uh, dealing with the, those deficiencies. I would say that this has been uh, proven to be a really good example. Some other countries in the region also have this. And uh, for example, while when the Commission feels that you haven't been improving your capacities in the um, cartel area, in the public procurement, you extract this deficiency and then you develop specific activities that the, countries, the country will be doing in the next year in order to uh, remedy the situation. So. Um, Along with the negotiations with the SAA, with IPA, this is another tool. As you can see, there are lots of parallel activities that the country, <coughs> now a candidate country, has to go through in its relationship with, the, uh, with Brussels. Um, for the next uh, 2013 progress report, um, 
uh, as I told you, there is a kind of action plan that we have um, already adopted and, if, and it's available on our website on, uh, on how we shall be doing things in the next year. In this, this year, sorry. Um, opening of negotiations. It happened on the 26th of, uh, 29th of June uh, last year. But uh, there was another decision on the, the December Council in 2010, which actually called for a kind of uh, creation of uh, negotiating structures and already um, a start of work on chapters 23 24. These two chapters that have become very famous are rule of law chapters. So, uh, 23 is uh, justice um, uh, and the fundamental rights, judiciary and fundamental rights, and 24 is justice, liberty, and security. Um, there have been some talks on, um, and there is a funny thing now on, uh, ongoing with our negotiations. Uh, there is another chapter called the TNT, Trans European Networks, which is, um, you can't even call it a specific chapter. And there have been lots of uh, discussion whether to abolish this chapter and to have 34 chapters. But since this uh, chapter would completely um, create another kind of division on uh, uh, enumeration of uh, chapters, and 23 would become 22 and 24 would become 23, they decided to uh, actually, in the commission, to retain the chapter and not to um, lose the <laughs> already known or uh, public uh, image of these two uh, rule of law chapters. But um, what happened in, um, after December 2011? was that we actually started negotiating on these two chapters, rule of law, and creating structures without the, the real official opening of accession negotiations. So you see, this is the new approach, which really opens up the way for countries to deal with the political criteria with the rule of law um, immediately, rather than waiting until the end of the accession negotiations and then not being able to produce the main thing, which is currently the uh, track record. Um, if you remember the uh, previous enlargements and um, uh, in your country uh, also, I mean, the, um, the very nature of uh, negotiations is alignment with the acquis. Nowadays, the, um, uh, the demand from Brussels is not just to align yourself, but also to show uh, credible results and credible data on whether the system is functioning. And that's exactly what the new approach is, a very elaborate way of how you actually present um, the way you deal with asylum or, let's say, the Schengen uh, criteria or the, uh, the reform of the judiciary. So it's not just um, enough to say we have completely aligned our legislation, our constitution with the needs on the independent and autonomous judiciary, but we need actually to show that the uh, judges that are appointed actually pass through a very transparent and very elaborate kind of testing and uh, and that the, the, the actually the lists made are, uh, are the, the lists of the judges that pass or when they are appointed or uh, promoted are trans first transparent and then that you actually have the first on the list passing to become a judge. So this is really uh, something uh, quite different than in the previous enlargements where the countries, the candidates, were not asked to produce this kind of track record. Not to talk about the corruption uh, cases or organized crime cases when we have to also to present all kinds of tables of what's happening with the case uh, on this and that. And this, is, this has created a kind of a completely different way of communicating the progress of the country towards Brussels. Uh, uh, maybe we can come back to these rule of law chapters uh, later on in the discussion and, uh, and then uh, talk more about it. The negotiations themselves, so we created, to be frank, the model according to the Croatic uh, experience because the Croats are the latest in their accession negotiations and uh, also the country which emerged from the ex-Yugoslav legal system, which helps. So we really try to actually use the best examples from the latest uh, enlargements and also talked a lot with the Icelandic. I also talked to the Turkish negotiator a lot, but their system is completely different, and the, the way how they negotiate is also a bit uh, uh, different in uh, time and uh, structure. And we created these six bodies. The, uh, the uh, college is basically the, the highest body. This is the prime minister, the vice prime ministers, and it's a political body. We'll have a meeting next Monday, which actually goes through all the uh, sensitive issues, if you could say. So, uh, for example, the euro that we unilaterally use. Now, when we open the, uh, open the Economic and Monetary Union uh, chapter, obviously the euro 
has become an issue. I mean, what to do with a country which has a euro as its own currency, but it's not a member of the euro, and it's not a member of the EU. So the college discusses these kind of uh, top issues and how we shall proceed with the preparation of, <coughs> on, uh, of, the, of the chapter and the negotiating position in uh, chapter 17. Then, of course, the state delegation, which opens up and closes the chapters. The negotiating group, which I chair, it's uh, basically me and uh, some 10 negotiators. And I'll show you the, um, who they are and who actually coordinate uh, 35 chapters. And then the working groups. This is, uh, these are two supporting bodies, but the working groups are the core element. They are the basic structure. And uh, I don't know which one is the... Um, so as, as you can see, the working groups actually do the job. They, they possess the knowledge. They go to Brussels, they discuss the chapters, and they, they actually are constituted on, of um, people who are experts. We have also applied a completely new thing to, the, to this uh, kind of um, structure. Because previously the enlargements had the public administration in these kind of bodies, all of them, and maybe some representatives of the civil society, meaning the trade unions and academia. We have uh, widened the scope and now we include the NGOs too. So any NGO which wants to contribute and to be the part of the uh, structure can apply. Of course there is a kind of procedure. So now we have um, uh, a kind of um, uh, a structure where 20% of people come from the civil society, which for a small country is a great system because obviously uh, nobody in Montenegro thinks that only the public administration can or should do, do the job alone. And uh, that has become a sort of a characteristic of our uh, Montenegro way of acceding because once you uh, get not just the NGO working or let's say um, uh, human rights, but also when you get the milk federation representative or milk producers uh, federation or uh, egg producers uh, federation representative, you get the people in, we discuss it within the groups, and then it becomes a joint solution or a joint proposal and not something that has been, uh, let's say, uh, made from top down from the government and then widely debated within the public. Um, there is also the Parliamentary Committee for European Integration, newly set up in this uh, call of the, government, of the Parliament. And this uh, Parliamentary Committee should actually go through all the documents that we prepare in these structures and also give us a political clout, apart from the uh, government one. Of course, the government is the last or the, uh, the top uh, layer of, uh, of the decision-making. Um, here is how it looks. As you can see, it's a combination of um, of uh, different people, but these these are the negotiators. As you can see, if you can read, um, this lady, for example, coordinates five chapters. Um, this lady coordinates two, 23, 24, the, the famous one. So these are actually the people who uh, constitute a sort of a mini government cabinet which uh, discusses everything and uh, helps me in my work in order to coordinate things. Um, we have appointed now five people until now uh, because we have applied a consecutive approach to create a group after group, not immediately to have 35 group or 33 groups and then uh, to, to make mistakes. I, I rather wanted to have a sort of a very thorough approach. So once we get the invitation to do the screening and uh, the agenda with all the key that is going to be discussed, we appoint people and, and prepare for negotiations. And these are the groups. The, uh, we now have 19 groups for 19 chapters. As you can see, women are some 70% uh, of leadership here. So it's also good to have a, a kind of a gender disbalance in this case. Um, uh, I would say that this, uh, these people are actually experts in their own, on their own behalf because they are the ones who um, coordinate the work of the groups. This lady has finished the job because uh, uh, chapter 25 has been provisionally closed, so she can rest. Um, uh, but the rest, and especially those people who work on 23, 24, will have uh, uh, years of work ahead of them because chapters 23 and 24 shall stay open until the last, uh, let's say, chapters are closed. Among the, they should be closed among the last. That's the new approach. So they will have um, several years of work. All the rest, of course, will uh, work. Uh, will have a kind of a, a work span depending on uh, how 
um, the how actually the country is, uh, whether the country is ready for alignment and how uh, long it needs to, to align. And here is maybe the, for me the most um, uh, interesting uh, slide. These, these, these are the these are the chapters and the overview where we stand. You see, there are 35 chapters. It has grown. It's not anymore 30 or 31. Uh, the, of course, we will not create groups for 35, 35 34, and 5 because these two chapters are um, discussed uh, in the last year of accession. Uh, but 33 groups will be made. And as, as you can see, chapter 25 was closed in December. Uh, we have, uh, I, I could say, we are very much in line with the science and research. It's also one of the chapters with a very softer key which is not very problematic to uh, align with. But the good thing is that the Montenegro has um, created uh, some time ago a, a science ministry which has improved very much the uh, budgeting for science and also the approach to science itself in building technological parts and also seeing the importance of science as a basic thing for and research for a basic thing for the economy and also the education. These two are the chapters that we have received the screening reports. So the screening has been completely finalized. It's 23, 24. Now we work on action plans here, specific action plans, which are the opening benchmarks to create a kind of a 13 uh, action plans within these two. And uh, as you can see, these are the um, chapters now because the statistics here is mainly about the screenings, is what the um, screening has been finished and what not. Uh, you see here that the, uh, there are two kinds of screening, explanatory and bilateral. Previously that was multilateral and bilateral, because previously you had more countries going to a screening when you were presented with the key, and obviously it was multilateral. And bilateral one was when Ireland or um, Denmark went and actually uh, presented their own uh, legislation. Now, multilateral is called explanatory, and bilateral is also explanatory, but they still call it the bilateral. All of both are, are bilateral in their nature. Uh, we'll finish all of the screenings for 33 chapters until July, and then have a really good idea of where we stand when it comes to specific chapters. This will uh, open up the way of creating the NPA, the National Program of Accession. Every country had it. It's a very elaborate uh, plan <coughs> on how, you shall, how we shall align with the, with the Aki in the next five years. Um, so basically, um, as you can see, the, um, soon, with the Irish presidency in place now, we hope that we should be uh, opening chapter 26, Education and Culture, which is another easy, soft key chapter. And uh, work on some other chapters, like chapter 20, Enterprise Industrial Policy, and maybe some other chapter to, to be opened during the Irish um, uh, term in office. So um, I believe that the um, some of the chapters, and probably you could ask about that afterwards, are, are quite tricky, like the competition policy, mainly because of the state aid. It has been a problem for each country in their accession. The regional policy and coordination of structural instruments, this is one that uh, actually prepares you for using funds. So every country is uh, having a hard time uh, 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 preparing for what uh, becomes a huge change once you uh, switch from, as, as I told you, 35 million to some maybe 400 million that is available to a country once it joins. Um, Croatia had uh, some um, 140 million per year in IPA. Now it, can, it will have, it will have um, 14 billion for the next 17 years available. So you can see the difference in, in the amount of money that the country can use after it joins. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the hard ones would be the, uh, where is the environment, 27, I can't find it, uh, here it is, environment and climate change, it's very costly, um, actually, to align completely with the uh, demands of the EU, and, uh, of course, the, um, some uh, other chapters, which is the tricky chapter on economic and monetary, monetary, uh, monetary policy because of the euro. This one will be very costly, food safety, veterinary and phyto, because the, the chapter is 
uh, also calls for also laboratories and uh, border crossings to be equipped and everything. And I would say that the agricultural rural development will also help the country position itself and what we are going to produce in the common market, in the common agricultural policy, whether it is the Mediterranean kind of uh, fruits or, or it's uh, olive oil or it's uh, really uh, not investing in those kind of uh, um, agricultural uh, uh, production that you do not need. Um, and maybe some some uh, problems with the fisheries, not because of the policies. We don't have mackerel and no migration in the Adriatic. <laughs> the Italians have uh, caught everything up. Uh, but the, uh, because the policy, I would say that we have uh, a lack of administrative capacities to deal with the fisheries area. It's, uh, it's, um, it's kind of a new thing for us. We have a very small fishing fleet, so we'll have to develop a, a good uh, group of people or good administration to deal with the uh, alignment in this regard. Um, and this is the last slide it's, uh, uh, how to show you how actually we dealt with the negotiations in the, in the last year until now. So as you can see, <coughs> I've been I was appointed on, uh, uh, in December 2011. And then after a year, we managed to open and close the first one, uh, chapter on the 18th of December. So basically, this has been a really good thing to open and close the first chapter, no matter that it is uh, uh, a small one and a very easy one. We have managed to caught up with Turkey now after <laughs> lots of years of their negotiations. And, uh, but it, um, it, was very, it was crucial for us to see how actually you work on a chapter, because... Uh, it's not easy to get into the intricate fabric of dealing with the with Brussels. It's a very complex and very uh, interesting way of communicating and and uh, drafting negotiating positions and so on. Also, we have really had a good cooperation with the with the Icelandic. Uh, they've been really helpful. We have a constant change of uh, information, no matter that they are completely different in the substance of their negotiations. But there are lots of things that we can relate to, and of course, with the with the countries of the region, with Croatia, we have we are now developing a really good program of of uh, expertise uh, sharing, and where the Croat experts will, through their uh, center of excellence, help us in uh, in uh, showing maybe the most important thing is what not to do. Sometimes that's more important in this huge jungle of things that you have to do in the European <coughs> integration. The Slovenes have been really um, uh, present in the country, the Slovaks. I would say that mostly the new member states have been more sensitive uh, towards helping the, the candidate countries, maybe because of their fresh uh, experience. On the other hand, um, now we have been talking a lot with the Irish government to uh, sign a memorandum on uh, cooperation in the European integration area where the Irish experts could help us, especially in those areas that the Irish are good as, for example, as the funds, uh, as I told you, and also in some other areas. Um, um, and uh, I would say that um, the last year has been very dynamic, but maybe the best message that I brought from all of my visits to the European capitals is the, that the European uh, integration is really an amazing way of actually getting countries together. They have never had a kind of a bilateral uh, uh, cooperation or communication at, the, at this level. So it's really a good platform for developing bilateral relations and also seeing how actually people can meet. Not just the public administration, but really exchanging people and, and getting to know each other. And that's the point of the whole story of, of uh, our integration. Not just to align ourselves and to, to use the standards of the European Union, but be, to become again a part of the of the common Europe, of the joint of the unified Europe where we feel that we belong and not anymore to the um, I would say uh, troubles of the 90s and the Cold War years of, uh, of the previous uh, decades. So I would stop now and maybe open up. Thank you very much.